So maybe we could get started. Christmas, it's just a lot of Please, quiet. Ken was born in Hong Kong and immigrated as a child with his family in Toronto. He graduated from the University of Toronto and took a master's degree in education with a focus on cognitive development at Harvard. And got his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania with Randy, who studied spatial navigation in rats. He moved on to a postdoc looking at spatial learning in honeybees, not only to broaden his outlook, but because, like some of us, he developed a terrible allergy with rats. <laughs> uh, he continued with spatial navigation and cognition in pigeons, more bees, ants, but also an interest in cognitive development issues, co-authoring papers with a variety of developmental psychologists working with a computer science students studying computer-produced animation materials for education purposes, and produced a variety of papers in journals from the Journal of Economic Psychology, Computers and Education, as well as more traditional journals in psychology and biology. Ken says that during his work with Randy, quote, in graduate school I was slow in getting going, with three years gone and even by way of good results to show for them. A number of what I thought were well-conceived and well-done experiments were not working. I was looking for effects of spatial transformation on the features of a rectangular area on the rat's performance. I could see that they were clearly flummoxed in the transformed space, but the problem was that they did poorly in the control too. But, as, as he said, the nature, nature threw a lovely curveball, and the problem turned out to be a very interesting finding. The errors the rats were making in the control condition were systematic and helped explain the limits of rotational errors. As he reports, in an exciting meeting with Randy, Randy one morning, he kept muttering, Randy, that is, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting. <laughs> Rochelle was the director of the graduate studies program when he started, and he remembers that she was instrumental in making sure that suitable facilities were necessary to carry out the research in his first year, keeping other students from encroaching on the little lab room, lab room where he was keeping the rats running. As he now writes, 20 years have passed at the choir, he says it's hard to believe that the family here in Australia feels like home. Uh, he says he met Randy and Rochelle a couple of times when they were still in L.A. once when they visited the Cognitive Senate, uh, the Senate, Sciences Center at McGuire. Sometime in the two, early 2000s, if you recall correctly. Randy and Rochelle might remember better, but I wrote a small complimentary commentary with Randy appearing in, wrote a commentary with Randy appearing in 2005. Ken It's just a great honor and a great pleasure to be here at this great occasion uh, among so many uh, young at heart old friends, some of whom I haven't seen in like 30 years since I graduated. So today, in this talk, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to compare humans to ants on this particular question. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my scientific history. So when I graduated from Penn, I went to do a postdoc on bees, so I had a string of research on bees, which I also picked up when I got to Australia. So there's a few papers on bees. Uh, I spent a bit stint at the University of Toronto, in which I studied pigeons, and tidy a little sum of research on, on uh, spatial orientation, spatial cognition in pigeons. Um, the thing, I guess the thing, one thing about a tidy bee story is that there's, you know, there's really no need to follow it up. And so it's actually the, the messy rat story that gets cited <laughs> more and more. Probably, probably the one rat paper I'll shine, I'll, well, I'll impact in terms of citation counts, all the pigeon work. Anyway, um, probably along the way I've accumulated about a dozen papers on humans various topics, not only spatial stuff, but stuff on face, face recognition and categorization as well. The most bizarre species I've worked on, the most incredible setting is this, what's shown on the left here, this is in the salt pans of South Australia, in which there is one heat-loving species of ant that has yet to have a name, so it's Melophorus sp, 
<laughs> SP is a species, not salt pan. <laughs> right. And uh, they live in this forbidding environment. It's all white. It looks like a skating rink, but it's actually salt encrusted dry lake. Um, how they make a living there, nobody's quite sure, but there's only about two pages of um, One of which only says that it it's prey for lizards that live there. So we know next to nothing about this species. But the species that we're looking at most, you'll hear something about the red honey ant, which looks like that. So it's a quite a common ant, it's the most thermophilic on the continent. That means it's the most heat resistant to heat oven. So what's optimal? What's the sense that I want to talk, talk about? This is what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, so in one sense, um, optimal performance is you know, having uh, investing in the right amount of brain if you like to do what you need to do. And this is this matters, this brain is costly. So when we talk about humans and ants, we're sort of on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Humans somehow invested largely in so I got this slide from a colleague who teaches a course on human evolution. He said, well, in the last two million years or so now, there's been a spike in the evolutionary trajectory, an increase of our brain. Why axis then? Actually, on a long scale, not clear on the, the y axis. So that's some incredible fact. So we, we put a lot of brain into the equation. And on the other side, specialized in getting the job done with little brain, but we do the allometry, and Dana and company have done that, and so especially small one brain, so that's shown by the fact that this, you know, this line that it relates body size to brain size is especially low in ants compared with these various surgery lines. Let's try turning the lights down. All right. Not too much. <laughs> Wait, and if you don't like it, we'll turn it back on. Yeah, no. Is there an intermediate level? Yeah, we need yeah. light. There's no the, intermediate. The font can't be read anyway. Mm. Try this one. I think it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark to yeah, turn the light on. No, I mean, very effective. I think we're stuck with this one. Yeah, it's on to sound. It's on to sound. It's on to sound. It's on to sound. Yeah. Okay, fine. So the other sense that we'll talk about is you know, doing the best with the resources you've got. <laughs> you know, you know. mm -hmm. And I want to look at two things in finding a place. One is to use multiple cues. So generally using more cues gives you uh, um, better reading of any particular value or variable that you're trying to estimate. Mm -hmm. The second topic is concerns uh, search actually physically moving around and searching for a place. So we'll get there. Let's start with some cues. So, so humans routinely integrate multiple cues in perception and in, uh, spatial perception and spatial cognition. This is an example of spatial perception from Ali and Burr. Uh, basically the setup is that they have a bunch of speakers operating in a lab room and a photo of it. And they show people law. And the judgment is to judge where, you know, which direction it comes from. And it's a you know, two-choice cycle physics, fourth-choice situation. So on the key trials, they separated the two sources. So the sound comes from one speaker, that's misplaced with respect to where the visual model comes from. Probably all the ventriloquist effect, in which the vision is supposed to capture the audition, right? Mm -hmm. That's this ventriloquist who mm -hmm. moves the mouth of a puppet and sings talks without the mouth opening, you think that you think that the public is talking, right? Well you do get the ventriloquist because the back the visual cues are very good. So on these psychophysical lines, basically positive slow means uh, subjects rely most on the visual cue, and negative slow means subjects rely most on the auditory cue. And what they've done is you know there's a blob that indicates the visual cue. Blob is very interesting and blurry, then humans will actually rely more on the um, auditory cues, like shown by these lines of negative slopes. The lines go through there, the authors of liners are not perfect. They are predictions based on the Bayesian principles, based on how subject perform in other areas, no free parameters in the model. Pretty amazing. Anyway, at any rate, what it indicates is that we 
perceive such a cue with a visual and spatial discrepancy somewhere in between using both cues. This I thought just so cool, I'll tell you about it from Bill Warren's lab. This is what I've done with in virtual reality. So you think walking, to, the subject's job is to walk towards something you think about this head mount of virtual reality, and walking towards the post, virtual post, and you think, well, that's obvious. Cube, right? Is that more than the um, mixed up the visual cues? Normally, when you walk towards somewhere, that's the focus of expansion. That's where the cold ray expands from. Well, they displaced it by 10 degrees. So the focus of expansion was 10 degrees mismatch from where you're pointing towards. <laughs> so, if you're walking towards the object, it basically moves to the left. So, if you're following, if you're beaconing in on an object, you should follow this curved path. But if you're in a straight line, that's like 10 degrees to the left of the focus of expansion. And then you can hit it straight there. Subjects do something that's in between. They seem to rely on both the focus of expansion mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and the beacon. Right? So this is mm -hmm. dynamic mm -hmm. cues that are used in combination. We don't know whether the cues are optimally weighted in this case. That wasn't a calculation. Now, humans can also use categorical cues as, as uh, one kind of cue. So basically, in, in spatial terms, the categorical cues means it's in some region of which the sensoid of the region is the peripheral type. Right? So if you're vague about where the exact location is, but you know it's in that region, then the sensoid should be averaged, right? because it's all of the information that you know you have certainty about. Right? Um, this is the cut work, so cut most of Probably all the developmentalists would know who she is. Uh, but buddy of mine, so in this experiment, I uh, in uh, 1991, the task is very simple. The subjects had a sort of little spot on the monitor in a, um, in a circular space. Those lines aren't there. Um, they aren't there on, on, the, on the task. But what they show is that subjects seem to be uh, dividing the space into four quadrants. So you not only remember sort of a position where the actual location is, we also remember its top left quadrant. So top left categorical information. That means what they expect uh, uh, is that the, um, the remember direction you know, around the circle should be biased towards the category centers, toward the diagonals. Um, and that's exactly what they found. Well, those are the data. And that's systematic bias shows that. We are biased towards the category centers in this task and in other tasks as well. Can who are the subjects? These are adults. I think students. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess students. I don't remember their exact propositions. They are adults. <laughs> so, do ants do this kind of integration in multiple cues when it comes to spatial localization? I'm going to show you some evidence that they do. But First of all, we'll give you some background on what the answer I'm going to tell you about, and something about the, the, the uh, brief lesson to the spatial navigation of the ants. So, this ants that I study, uh, the Lockwood Pagot, is called a red honey ant. Lockwood Pagot, it's too, it's too, which is an aboriginal term meaning sun, sun, but they only come out on sunny days and hot days in the summer, in the middle of the day. It's a nine to five ant. <laughs> so very good field work for students, no getting up early, no staying up there. <laughs> so uh, they share this niche that's very cluttered visually, and there's a lot of other ants living in there. They basically uh, have the time to themselves when it's really hot in the middle of summer, but it's too hot for the other ants. So that's what you get from being heated that way. You can have a um, basically competitive free situation when you go and they eat both uh, insects and plants. They do collect nectar, that's why they call honey ants. So, in terms of this, the navigation of the toolkit, they do path integration. So, what, what that means is keeping track of the path as you travel, you know, reference to external uh, landmarks, if you like. So, the number of steps you take in a particular compass direction, that's what you. 
So what about is a compass, and if some compass tell you which compass direction the Earth you're traveling in, an odometer, which is some, some kind of counter of the number you've got, and then you've got to integrate the process. You've got to know that the five steps you've just taken is in the north. You can't just have a power of direction separate from power steps, because that will be a when you're adding up vectors. We also use views in some way, terrestrial views. And I will show you some evidence to suggest at least that what, what the view consists of is something in the panorama, not particularly individual landmarks and not beacons. Beacons, I think, is actually difficult for a lot of insects to use. And they have a systematic search strategy because all those exact strategies that are inexact application in view based navigation supposed to get you to the goal of biological systems being what they are, it's error prone, and you're going to need to search around in the rough area in order to find your nest. So, the evidence of path integration in any animal, let's include vertebrates as well, as well as humans, uh, the basic evidence in, in non human animals, what you do is you know, before the animal gets to go, you displace the animal. And if it's using path integration, it's kept track of the outbound um, track, then what it should do well, after you displace it to a strange place is to still head in the compass direction that it would head. Had it not been uh, displayed. All right? And that's what these ants do. So you come to a feeder, you take them somewhere far away where they don't recognize anything, you look at which direction they head off in. That's the home direction from the feeder, which is indicated at the top in these circles. So it doesn't matter the outbound distance, these are four different outbound distances from 6 to 30 meters. All right? The odometer process, um, this clever work was done in the North Africa. Uh, there's a man uh, by the name of Captain Glyphus, he doesn't have a common name, but Captain Glyphus is now among the navigation crowd anyway, so well known that people who study this thing sometimes call Captain Glyphologists. That's <laughs> <laughs> made it into the scientific literature now, to, to the title of one of the famous papers. Uh, but here's Wittlinger um, found some evidence of step counting. A form of step counting is a mechanism that ants keep track of uh, the distance. Mm -hmm. well, these ants come out on a linear uh, channel. A channel basically keeps them going in one direction. They end up in the feeder. Before they go home, they change the legs of, the, of their legs in some operation. <laughs> uh, the controls don't do anything. The stump ants, you shorten their legs, you basically cut off the bottom section. Easy operation for a student to do. The other one, boy, that took effort. At the end, you're using the right kind of glue to glue fine pig hair to make the legs actually longer. So, this is a paper called Walking on the uh, Stilted Stumps. And as you might expect, it's a step counting mechanism. The ones on stumps, well, they underran the estimated distance home. The ones on stilts, they overran. So, so um, and that of course only works on the one yeah. first trip. The next trip they come out of the long legs, they are adjusted to the long legs, and then they walk on the walk on the long legs. So that really shows the change between the outbound legs of their legs and the inbound legs. <laughs> In terms of the compass, we use a number of cues. Um, all of these are external cues, so that the actual position of the sun gives them a compass cue. The bigger cue is this type of polarized light. So when light comes through the sky, um, it gets scattered in a systematic way. Think of it as jiggling in a particular direction. And the direction of polarization shows you where the sun is. Because wherever the, 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 the direction of polarization means the sun is perpendicular to that direction. So in principle, this gives you one of two directions for the sun, because it's 180 degrees. And the gyrity is two directions perpendicular to all the bars. Right? Um, in theory, anyway, in practice, ants might be able to disambiguate this ambiguity. At least there are suggestions uh, in Lotus that there are 
are cells that respond to one particular direction of polarized light. We have to take this as a bit uncertain because it's only been found in six cells so far in the central complex of the locus. And a lot of the story is computational. The team didn't actually show the whole panorama, they only showed little pieces. They tried to do computations based on a lot of these little pieces. All right, so the spectral pattern um, means that um, there are intensity differences in their different uh, spectral patterns. So it's like um, the sky on the side opposite the sun has more, relatively more UV wavelength. Right? On Earth, where the sun is shining on, that side looks brighter. Right? We do this when we take photos, we have to stand facing the sun on that side. The brighter than as standing under the sun. So those, uh, that's supposed to be the package of cubes that the ants can use. All right. Um, in terms of the panorama, what we can do to actually characterize the panorama, so what you show in the top there is you've got this lens that actually takes a, a, a panoramic photo. It's a 360 degree lens. And then with software, you can unwrap it so that the view will be there is a cylindrical view. What that means is that's what you see if you turn at 380 degrees, 360 degrees around you, right the left edges coincide. Imagine the cylinder wrapped around you. That's what this view in the middle is. We can blur it, cut off the ground, we can blur it to hand vision, which is what we want to show to be. And we just divide the objects into ground objects versus sky objects. That first the sky, that's called a skyline. Alright? Skyline, which I'll show you, is quite you know, important for our navigation. And the ants typically look at the scene before they actually set up in any of these situations. Especially if you're doing a test and they're coming up with some strange situation. So here's a little movie what they do by way of looking around. So it's an ant carrying a piece of cookie. Movie slowed down tenfold. It's taken with a high speed camera. About 300 frames per second camera is playing at 30 frames per second. So there's the man. There she is doing little dances. She does a little few more pirouettes. Oh, let's see which direction is where it's that. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right, that direction is in. <laughs> could, you, could you darken the screen just one? For a minute, yeah, so let's repeat that. that video that's video. Yeah, yeah, it's a Yeah, it's a Getting its bearings. Oh. Yeah, I uh, uh, recently turned that could be called a form of alternate communication, communicating with oneself, not being able to read the information. I can't process that. Uh, <laughs> this little experiment shows that it's not just a single object that they're tending to be trying to hold in using this panorama. Um, that sort of three meter by two meter beacon, if you like, it's situation, situated right behind the nest, like about half a meter. Uh, which drop was standing there not part of the sea? <coughs> the question is, you know, would, would the ant use this beacon if you displaced into a completely strange panorama? Right? Um, so the beacon looks really strong if you right at the nest. Um, but if you're a few meters away, you know, then it's still be a little blob in the middle of a whole lot of blobs. So the ant might be learning to use a whole panorama rather than the single blob. Well, most of us would expect that we put them in a strange place and put them two meters in front of them of a beacon. Um, we, to us humans, that looks quite obvious. Look, there's this three by two meter beacon there. We see this object, surely you're all going to knock the hands. They start to search on the spot as if they don't recognize the scene. And first of all, when you take the whole panorama, the scene looks strange. There's only this little part that matches. The rest of it doesn't match. They look like they're going to a search pattern. So 
So that was a sobering lesson, an indication that they probably don't individuate objects and landmarks mm -hmm. uh, for, for directional cue in this case. They're probably using the whole panorama in some way. So one of the things they use is the skyline that told you about the hallway that came down a couple of summers from the University of Sussex. And when it's they did it to recreate what the skyline looks like um, from a figure were trained to go back and forth on. So on the top of the B there, you see what the, what the scene looks like at the, uh, at the feeder, and at the bottom of the D there, that's called the reconstruction. It's only a rough reconstruction. It's only matching that elevation every 15 degrees, very rough skyline. Would the hands use this artificial skyline that's otherwise, besides the skyline, no resemblance to the real scene? Uh, the answer is they do. Oriented, the, um, the artificial skyline is oriented in the same compass direction as the real scene. They also use the skyline when it's rotated. So here they're ignoring the sky views, preferring the skyline, the terrestrial skyline. Only the skyline. Everything else about the scene is just matching black cloth instead of the green trees and dirt. Alright? Be captured in this case by the sky. Um, this is of some, not just of academic interest. I now find out that there, there's a, there a project afoot to get cars up to drive themselves, to navigate by themselves. And one team is trying to use skyline information to actually get a car automatically driving cars to navigate. Well, they've got some success going around on a pretty small circuit. Uh, at the moment. So how they define skylines basically by the UV level. There's a lot of UV and they call it sky. There's not much UV in that part of the call it the ground. And the green indicates areas where the sea would recognize correctly about the skyline. I think it'll take a lot more than skyline information to get a truly mapping system like this. But this is going to be important because Honestly, driving vehicles are not only safer, but can replace um, cut down car use. So, actually, this is actually going to be a tool in fighting climate change. You never think that hand navigation is connected with fighting climate change, but how convinced that it is. <laughs> Alright, let's go on. Um, searching. So, what hands do when they come to place, usually, which is usual, they make little errors and they have to search around. They go down in little loops in search. The loops keep going back to the origin of the search every now and then. They expand African species, cataclyphus ants do this as well, as well as the ants we study in the red honey ant and the long So here are just some data from the species that we study. Um, three different columns. There are three different home distances that the ants form. Top and bottom uh, is the differences in time. First 20 meters of search versus 20 to 40 meters of search. And you can see that the search goes on, it spreads out, covers a bigger territory. So that's what the ant does in this kind of searching. The search is also different as a function of the outbound distance. Wow. Well, think about it, when you're six meters out, <laughs> your, your path integration is less accurate. So you're less certain about where you are, right? You're more likely to be in error. And so the spread spreads out faster. And there's good 12 meter conditions compared to 2 meter conditions. I kind of look at the things too. Some sensitivity to uncertainty here in guiding the search behavior. Some years ago, right, while I was having a lead in Berlin, yeah, I got to this paper by Thomas Hills, who thinks that this kind of area restricted searching actually has deep evolutionary significance. Uh, Hills argues that cognitive searching in all kinds of animals, including us humans, is related to um, area restricted search. That we search the you know, forms of our representational space, if you like, as a desert animal search for its, for its home. I'll show you a wee bit of data at the end that's actually sort of 
that might suggest this. All right, let's talk about integrating cues now. So in the next few slides, I'll show you a small select number of situations that show that uh, ants integrate different cues in picking a direction to the initial direction of heading. In this particular experiment that concerns path integration and compass cues using path integration. So, if path of a polarized light in this position of the sun, what Leipam and Lona would do is decouple those two on the outbound journey. So, they had the ants come out on the channel. That means you can control what they see over the channel. You put an artificial polarizer in there to basically change the real, real direction of, of uh, polarized light. Mm -hmm by the amount that's indicated by this uh, bluish blue, arrow there. The sun that it blocked, and the sun was in this correct position. When the ants home, then they're using the polarized pattern, a different polarized like direction. Basically, you've got this, um, you've got this conflict in this direction, which is polarized light, and that direction, which is according to the sun. Hmm. What do the ants do? Well, Something in between. <laughs> so, one of those lines represents using um, sun, and the other line, the slanted line, represents using polarized light. And when you put all the data together, as I've done in a quick summary, the bottom line is they're using both. So, they're averaging these two sources of direction somehow. Alright? One little brain, it's, you know, you have a brain to it. The second example we've done with um, our species of ants, we put them in these funny boxes, and we, I mean, really, we scratch fox, show ties, and hell, did all the, all the work. I'm not sure why they had a box that's so big and so tall, because it was a heroic effort to try to lower the ants. We put it in a tall box. Uh, to, uh, about a, you know, 120 centimeter tall box At any rate, the ants um, came out to a feeder, trained to a feeder, and then on one of the trips they got taken to the feeder and they got put in this goniometer, which basically is a, is a circle that allows us to track which direction the ants head off in the initial direction. Okay, so then we could block in the UV light on which the polarized light comes depends. We could also change the direction of the sun. So they did this by something that Felix Sanchi did over a century ago, which is to reflect the sun in the mirror. All right. So I can change the real position of the sun. Let's look at the top line first. That's just an ant in one of these boxes. No matter how much we block the UV, the ants are still well oriented. Basically, we fail to knock them down in this way. They're using some palette of cues that we couldn't knock down. So if we block the UV and we block the sun, they're still using something in the spectral patterns in order to get in the right direction. When we mirror the sun, however, then we get this compromised behavior. And the compromised behavior especially shows up in the UV information and on this polarized light information is not very good. And that's in the low and high UV blocking boxes. Um, so, then they use the sun to some extent, and they use the rest of the cube to some other extent. Right. I don't know if the rest of the cube includes polarized light in, in, in these conditions. Um, that, that was the question I said earlier. Despite the 180 degree ambiguity, it depends on whether you believe there's a 180 degree ambiguity or not. If there is a 180 degree polar, uh, and the beauty and the polarized light is useless at any rate. Uh, at any rate, it's the sun versus at least the rest of the spectral cues, which we of course did not reflect, right? One side will still be brighter because it's against the sun, one side of the earth, right? The other side will be dimmer because it's sitting under the sun. Okay. So there again is a case of um, averaging cues. In this case, Maximum discrepancy possible, 180 degrees. Next two pieces I want to show you that these ants are averaging um, two different sorts of systems. They're averaging the 
dictates from path integration with the dictates from the panorama. Mm -hmm. So this experiment is done on Catholicus uh, by Matthew Collin. And he had this situation in which if you look at A, the ants come up in the channel on the way to the feeder, they turn 90 degrees and then they get to the feeder. All right. So there are two sorts of cues that can use. Path integration, which are indicated in red. And there's also a compass direction upon exit from the um, from the, the channel, right? which is green arrow. Basically, you, uh, you learn either you turn 90 degrees or head to go in that part of the panorama. That's how the panorama. There are some distant panoramas. On the critical test, what Matthew did was displace the ants some amount of distance. Let's just look at one. Matthew displaced them about four meters in front. So now the ants have to track this four meters, and according to its path integration, the goal should be there. Not that. That's ten meters this way, and then six meters that way. Right? According to your program, out of channel, turn 90 degrees, and face this particular compass direction, they should go here. Okay? So that's the situation here shown in two. Green means follow the earthly cubes. So in a particular earth direction, when you have the channel, the red dot, that's where you should go according to your path integration system, and what the ants do in this situation. And it's pretty clear if you look at the data, uh, they go somewhere in between. Again, averaging these two completely supposedly separate systems. Right? One based on earthly landmarks, and one based on the path integration and sky compass cues. Our ants do something similar in a slightly different setup. So, in this setup, we look here first, <coughs> we train to go back and forth between the nest and the field. And there's sort of a wall around it. That just, that just Ants going in this particular direction, of course, we get more subject. Uh, I think the, the experiment with the last thing that they even still jump around the, the edges below the, the walls, so it's a created sort of a moat to keep them within this boarding corridor. They train for two days to come in, come in to the feeder and go back to the nest. By that time, the ants have learned, of course, not only the sky in this direction, they've learned whatever. Earthly landmarks around to use the earthly landmarks. And then we, on a, on a test, you displace them to these different locations of so RP1, RP2, RP3. Okay? Now you have to refer to this little diagram on another insect. So from RP1 and RP2, the scene would look a bit similar. And should be able to figure out the panorama of the direction pole, which is at about 180 degree variance with the direction from the feeder. Right? Feeder is up in the wrong direction from these points are about down there. That's the, this is the location RP3 is supposed to be completely unfamiliar and it should be lost. Well, that's sort of what the views look like at these different locations. And RP1, I'm sure you can see the similarity from compared with the view from the nest. You might be stretched from half to find a similarity in RP2, Nobody will find anything similar in RP3. At least I'm supposed to find a similarity between RP2 and the nest. Well, at the distant location, the ants are indeed lost if they don't have path integration information. You do that kind of test by letting the ants come to the feeder, take a bit of home, take a bit of cookie, run home, and then you grab them just before they go home. That way they run off their path integration vector. Path integration says you're home. Basically, that wipes that system off the map, if you like. Um, and then they're lost if you put them in this strange location. If they still, if you take them to the feeder, then they have path integration information. Path integration information points to the top. That's the direction they should head to the home. And they indeed use the path integration direction. The home direction, the mean direction is roughly the home, the correct home direction. If you display uh, zero vector ants to these um, strange locations, right? So these 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 ants now have, don't have the path integration information. But there's some thing about the scenes in RP1 and RP2 that can direct them to the 
pole direction, which is at about 120 degrees, remember? But they're roughly correct there. But that just shows that there is earthly information there that they can use. So now in this situation, they have both earth information and they have also sky information. What do they do? Well, they head somewhere in between, once again. The indirection, statistically, in between those two theoretical directions in real life. And even more, at the nearer location, which is RP1, they put more reliance on the terrestrial landmass. So the terrestrial landmass look like they're more reliable. They put more weight on them, put very little weight on them. RP2, the scene looks a bit that's at least in, in the right ordinal direction for Bayesian predictions. But of course, we don't know if they're actually weighting the two exactly the optimal weight. That's a question yet to be answered. Let me now turn to the second part that I want to talk about, which is mostly about the property of the deep search. This is generated on a lot of um, recent literature there. Um, what it means is distributing your, your so in, in this particular um, uh, characterization, this particular ball game that these modelers play, you divide a search pattern into a number of straight leg lengths. Right? And then you look at the distribution of the length of those straight segments. So that's what we're talking about. And what are the research looks like has a power law. Distributed the power function of the length of search P, there is back to probability. And the exponent should be somewhere between minus 1 and minus 3. Minus 2 is not optimal. Right. What are its properties? Right. So, what it means is that it, uh, this, this is of some few, uh, theoretical importance because it's supposed to be optimal for looking for smallest target for which you no idea where it is. But all your spatial knowledge is useless. Right? So some, some food patches are distributed this way. Right? The monkey doesn't know which patch of trees has the fruit right in that day, then that's a strategy that it might use. Right? Ants in this situation are often looking for these sparse bits of dead afterparts scattered who knows somewhere around there. It's called heavy tail because it contains a lot of long segments interspersed between occasional short segments of search. That's its characteristic. It's got some really long segments. And it's also called scale free because amongst the occasional long segments, there are even more occasional, more rarer, even longer segments. So that you can look at it, if you look at it at any scale, it's like fractal. Among the long segments, there are occasional super long segments. Among the super long segments, there are occasional super super long segments. So if anyway, the search goes on infinitely, it will go on in this fashion. So that's what it's called scale free. It's also called super diffusive. Come on, these terms. So diffusive means this, it, it spreads out roughly in the, in the pattern of Brownian motion in, in diffusion. Right? So the way to visualize this. Uh, the spread is diffusive. You put a bit of sugar in your coffee, you wait for it to spread, right? Eventually, the sugar will spread and completely dissolve. To make it super diffusive, well, you stir it. <laughs> That's, so, um, the research does a bit of stirring. Like, it, it, it increases the spread of search uh, relative to just random, uh, random or brownian motion. All right. Now, along the roots, is there are statistical critiques about the right and the wrong ways to, to analyze the data to make sure that this model is the best. Right? The right way is now the maximum likelihood estimate, not trying to curve it into data. Um, it's got some empirical issues. This story is classic one of the kind of pointed out. So originally albatrosses were so thought to have these the these searches. Experimented used a device that basically sent a signal when it got wet 
<laughs> so the length of time between getting wet, they, they characterize it as a length of segment you know, for these albatrosses. What they did take into account is there's a whole lot of long dry segments which the albatross <laughs> just sitting on his nest. <laughs> those were kind of as long as, as long segments on the databases. This was a paper by this one and part of the colleagues published in Nature. And so here's the reaction. What do you do when your paper in Nature falls to pieces? You write another paper correcting the mistake and you publish it in Nature. <laughs> so now we've got a right story. It turns out when you do the data the right way, the outcome does do. Will our ants do this? Well, we looked at searching in ants, in this case, around the nest. To put the background to this, around the nest is familiar to this is not an area you would expect to be searched. You know where that area is, you have perfect spatial knowledge of it. Uh, they search either with these added landmarks around, which makes, the, which makes the scene change more quickly as you move around the, the nest area. Um, to get the answer search for the nest, well, no, we didn't recreate the scene somewhere else. A much simpler technology, we're putting a board on the nest so that we don't get to it. And they're walking over this board. <laughs> 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 and I'll find it if it worked. <laughs> it um, here, the top two lines show sort of a characterization of scene mismatch between different areas around the nest. And you can see that the mismatch right more frequently landmarks around, that's the column on the right. Down the bottom is what the ants do. Um, and true to form, when they have more better spatial information, so on the right side of the landmark, the search is more cluttered, more clustered, less spread out than in the case on the left, when they don't have the nearby landmarks. In terms of the distribution of um, length of segments, that's what it looks like. For some reason, the number of search distribution, we find we find that the second shortest segment has more uh, higher frequency than the shortest segment. So we don't know. We don't have an explanation for that. There might be some physiological constraint against walking very short segments. And anyway, we did do the analysis from the, you know, from the second segment on, so the second shortest uh, segment. When you look at the distribution, it comes out clearly it's not a research, it's an exponential search, it's a random box search. Uh, that's the orange orange line, and the researchers on the other line that don't fit. <laughs> right. So you might expect the the research of if you displace them to a completely unfamiliar territory, suddenly then nothing looks familiar and you have no idea where you there, the ants don't do that either. So in the B search should be a power function, you should have a power fit. Well, the power fit there is not as good as an exponential fit. And what it looks like is an exponential fit at two different scales. There's one shorter scale of exponential search, and then there's a longer scale. So one thing about these random walks is it's not scale-free. You've got to specify scale. Right? The scale determines how, how spread out the search is. They seem to be searching at two different scales. Well, that's the wrong way to analyze the data, meaning the data is perfectly. Uh, and Andy Reynolds is saying to analyze the data the right way. And thank goodness the story is still the same. It's still a double exponential search as the best fit. So our ants then don't do the research in the situation when they can, when they can and should. Here's another situation they might do. One dimensional search thing. So here basically there's no visual information. <laughs> Everything looks the same no matter where you are in the channel. Right? So they come out like 12 meters in the channel, they go back and then in the same kind of channel, 12 meters, and then they exit the channel, and there they are caught. Right? Occasionally you test them in a long 30 meter channel and just let them run back and forth and get these distributions of search lengths. <laughs> Distribution is there too, so it's a double exponential. That's the best fit. The power function, the power states again is characteristic of the researchers. Don't, don't 
of a fitness plan. Right. And this is again the wrong way to analyze the data. We just we think that it and the maximum likelihood estimation of the story comes out the same. Right. So ants do this double exponential, but they don't do it in the V situation where you might expect them to. Our latest thinking, however, is that they actually try to do it in the research using the tools that they have. They Got this thing in the toolkit that's the random walk. What they're doing is executing at multiple scales. And Andy Reynolds, uh, Reynolds is a mathematical biologist, very sophisticated in mathematics, he figured out that if you keep adding different segments, right, you keep expanding the scale of these, these the researchers, you would get something that approaches on the research. You just have a lot of different so he's analyzed other data on muscles that show that they, well, they do three different scales. They do tri modal patterns, three different scales of, of, um, of exponential search. And in fact, the author that published that paper, Science, first said that it was research. The final analysis discovered that it was actually these uh, adding up different, different piles of uh, exponential search. Okay. So well, that, that's what we think the ants are doing then. So that's their way of approaching the, the optimality. They're using the tools that they have and coming to that's something that's not exactly the research, but at least approaches the research. So that's our thinking. Uh, fossil traps have been analyzed recently, 50 million years old or, or older. And from the fossil tracks, you can analyze that whether the patterns of the search as well. Some worm like animal that's precursors probably to us all. Um, <laughs> and well, it's either one or the other. The top there are the fish based on the research, and the bottom there is based on this composite of exponential that I'm talking about that our ants do. Who knows? Fits are quite similar, so it's like probably either one or the other. So this kind of strategy is probably age old in, in evolution. What about humans? Okay. Rhodes and Turvey did this uh, actually a mental search task. They like try to get subjects to retrieve all animals. And they look at into response time, and the into response time come out with the research distribution, this power function. Mm. Right, that suggests, they're suggesting actually the research in our human mind. I'm going to leave that. <laughs> the real search in humans. Um, so the research has been found in the travels of mobile phones. Right? When mobile phones ring, this is looking at the locations of mobile phones. Uh, college students walking around campuses, walking around fairs, and so on. All of these have a bit of problem Devices like um, uh, college students' mobile phones can get into cars and trains, and that's how you can get long journeys. I think the best research are on these uh, hunter gatherer foragers, the Hansen. They were walking around with GPS devices to get the tracks. Um, these people have been living a traditional life, men go hunting, women go foraging, and grandmothers look after the kids. How traditional humans might look like. Um, and so this group recorded a lot of walks on outbound foraging and eventually on the way back. And what they found mostly were two different patterns. Some of them are the V lines, so that's the bottom, the red and blue there, roughly half the walks, males and females. And most of the rest fall into this composite Brownian walk, composite exponential search. Right. So there's only a tiny segment you can probably see this little band of green there that's actually a random walk. A random walk is definitely the minority. <laughs> Humans, it looks like, adopt one of two strategies search and foraging. Either they do some version of the research or they pile together uh, different scales of random walk. Two, three, four different scales to do the, to do the um, random 
search to do the foraging. So they seem to approach uh, uh, optimal searching partly as an ant or muscle or muscle tracks. <laughs> All right. Maybe yeah, because that's all the data I have to tell you. So uh, what I've shown you is that humans integrate multiple uh, sources of information. It's very often. Um, so do desert ants. They, they use multiple sources. They integrate different compass cues, come up with a compass direction. And they also use both terrestrial and celestial cues to, uh, to determine the direction of travel. Somewhere in the brain, to me, this spells the necessity for some integrating device that takes information from disparate sources that also suggests that disparate sources of information in the direction of the sun and direction of polarized light have to be somehow folded in the same quantitative terms. Right? Otherwise, how do you do averaging? Okay. So there's now a suggestion that Vincent Walsh in 2000 Three suggested you know, common representations. I think it monkeys saw number or you know, magnitude, right? I think Walsh was being scholarly, I believe the yeah. idea is from Gallus in 1990. So as far as searching, humans sometimes can do the B search, we also do constant uh, exponentials. But there's a nice something to be search, but we think they approximately by this uh, composite Brownian search. I've had a lot of collaborators and other agencies that help me. I thank them. I thank you for your attention. Let's have a few questions before we go to the last phase of our time together. I didn't really understand what uh, BV search was. Um, that's question number one. The other thing is, I wasn't clear how ants calculated distance except from the Bittlinger study. Uh, so could you just sort of clarify this? Yeah, so, so the BV search is an attempt to include really long segments of yeah. movement amongst a lot of what looks like area restricted search. So if you do a random walk, you basically restricted to one area. So what this kind of strategy does sometimes it allows you to move long distances so you're somewhere completely different. Right. And, uh, and that's um, according to some mathematical calculations is optimal when the source is looking for is very sparse. These guys are looking for a single nest so kind of like the really sparse location. Um, the odometry so what it suggests is some form of step counting is used to, to estimate how far you go. So that you change the step length and you get the answer to misjudge how far you've gone. It's a bit more sophisticated than that. That's the basic story. They're somehow counting the number of steps. So that implies that one of these uh, the, the approximate number system that you and others have talked about. That, that's what the odometer. Otherwise, I don't see how they could do odometer. That's what the odometer on your car does. If you put on bigger tires, you uh, throw off the odometer mm. uh, on your car because what it's really doing is just counting the uh, mm -hmm. the rotations. Right. Or on, your, on your Fitbit, you know. except when you go backwards. Harris <laughs> 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 Bueller's bad day. Other questions? So what? So if you, if you want to know whether the heat combination is optimal, then you have to measure the revised signal of each heat, right? Exactly. You need to walk back to the revised heat and the heat signal in the visual and So have you looked into that? Have you looked into doing that for like the sunlight and the polarized light, for example? We are hoping that we could do that. We're trying to set up a virtual reality system for ants in which we could control these cues and make them realistic, make them imitate the real world and yet have full Q control. 
Let me go, we got some grant money to do it. Project hasn't started yet, the grant hasn't kicked in as yet. So maybe in four years. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I felt very spoken to on the human side of my search. It's a fallback strategy when our location memory fails. You know, yes. the, the Cheerios are in the cupboard, the Windex is under the sink, the, the hammer is in the garage. But uh, when we forget where the keys or the cell phone or the remote control are, we start searching and stuff. I keep coming back to where I think it's really on me and sometimes do find it on the fourth try, even though I've been going gradually expanding spirals. Maybe I've gone out to the car, maybe I've gone upstairs. Uh, but that's just an observation. The question was, you're in Australia. Do you have any insight into the Malaysian Airlines search? <laughs> no, I don't think this. Because I, I suspect they just did a grid search. They're but doing they a grid search, search, so that's a bit dangerous. Yeah. But they're about to change the scale. Yes. Uh, it's very similar here. They yeah. get a grid scale, at a, and that really addresses your question, Brian. That, the levy search, as, as uh, Ken said, I just want to underline it, the defining characteristic is scale-free. If you're doing an exponential search, the, the, there's an exponential parameter that sets the scale, right? But the levy has no such... such uh, I believe that the Malaysian Air is trying to do a, a systematic coding. They're trying to code every line. They're assuming that their devices won't, won't make any mistake. It's a bit... Yeah. I don't know, it's a questionable assumption. Mm -hmm. Answer they can't do it. In fact, there's one that, I mean, otherwise you do the spiral search, right? You just spiral outwards. Um, so one animal, uh, there's an isopod, does that, but only for a small segment. You, you do a little bit. If you, after a few spirals, you don't find it, then you go into this, you know, looping search. Because you can't trust the you know, error of the cumulative of these spirals. So the thing with the spirals, you know, if you go past your goal and you miss it, then you spiral out or out and you never find it. You know, you, you, you doomed yourself. So if you're not 100% sure, you can't. You, should, you can't and shouldn't use that strategy. And lo and behold, it's not found in animals. It's a very small localized area to start on the search. So can I ask another question? How many ants get lost? What proportion of ants get lost? <laughs> I mean, how do you, in other words, how good are they at finding the nest again? They're very good. I've seen one or two. <laughs> they might have been blown by wind. Yeah. One of these things. Yeah.